now that we've opened up the Zoom. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lisa with the Law Library, and with me today is Kevin Murphy, who's going to be our speaker from the East County San Diego Bar Association. And I'd like to give a big thank you to the East County San Diego Bar for co-sponsoring this program today. I hope maybe some of the members will be joining us as attendees. Um, but we really appreciate their partnership in uh, bringing us a great speaker today from the association. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. This is going to be a CLE presentation today. So you will be getting a CLE certificate of attendance by email later uh, once the program is over and we verify who actually attended in our Zoom account. And also it is a interactive presentation. So if you have questions for Kevin as uh, the program goes along, Feel free to post those where it says Q&A. If you can see Q&A on your screen, that's where we would like you to post any questions that you have. Um, in that Q&A feature, you can either post them under your name or anonymously, whatever you like. And we'll hopefully get to as many of those as we can at the end of the program. And then one final thing, there is gonna be a link to a survey at the end of the program today. So if you would take just a minute or two, we always really appreciate any feedback that you have on our programs. So I think that's just about it. I'm going to go ahead and stop my video and turn things over to Kevin. And Kevin, you're muted. I'm glad you told me that. Thank you very much. I said thank you very much, Lisa. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very proud to be able to participate in this CLE. Um, I'm currently the vice president of the East County San Diego Bar Association, and we have a strong longstanding relationship with the San Diego Law Library, and we're happy to continue it. Uh, we have recently rebranded from, we were formerly known as the Foothills Bar Association. We are now known as the East County San Diego Bar Association, and we're actively revamping. So if anybody's interested, we have uh, very low dues member costs. I think it's 50 bucks and we do all of our CLEs are free. That's why any members from the East County might have been able to join this program by using a code. So in a nutshell, uh, my name is Kevin Murphy. I am an administrative litigator. I practice almost exclusively in professional licensed defense proceedings. We defend um, mainly healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, lawyers, pharmacists, dentists, but we also do other licensed professionals, including um, real estate brokers and agents, um, insurance salespersons and brokers, uh, contractors, geologists, um, I always joke, you know, I'll, I'm willing to consider to represent anybody except for an attorney because I can't imagine a worse client than myself or any of you attendees if your careers were on the line. So this program is going to discuss administrative litigation with specific uh, citations to the overarching code provisions. Um, but I did want to highlight, I myself am a professional licensed defense lawyer. So there are some um, other boards and departments that lawyers can represent people before, such as the EDD, the Department of Social Services, um, Social Security, and the Labor Board things like that I don't personally have experience in, but I'll try to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Um, and I just wanted everybody to understand where I'm coming from. That's my background is professional licensed defense. And we focus on defending healthcare professionals. Um, but again, we do other attended professionals as long as they're not lawyers. So uh, this is my law firm and my contact information. I'm Kevin Murphy. If anybody has any questions, of course, after the program, you're welcome to reach out to me. Uh, I had our staff put some of this, these recent accolades. We, we've got a longstanding track record of success. I've been focusing on professional licensed defense for the last 15 years, and it's a very um, niche, nuanced practice area. So 
my goal for this program is to give you an in-depth overview of administrative litigation to talk about the various laws and statutes governing authority and then to give you some real world practice tips um, advice and insights based on my experience so in my world again professional license defense the purpose of these hearings are to protect the public safety if a nurse accidentally injects the wrong medication in the right patient the boards are not there to punish them. Punitive legal actions are what the criminal courts are for. The sole jurisdictional authority for all of the boards and departments and various agencies in the state of California is the public safety protection. So I, I find it very important to highlight this because oftentimes in practice, it does appear to the public and to my clients that they're being punished um, unjustifiably or unnecessarily, as opposed to actually addressing any type of error in a manner designed to protect the public from future reoccurrence. And in the medical world, we have a thing called just culture. And the just culture doctrine holds, we want all medical team members to share information of mistakes that they make. We do that with full understanding that this is designed to increase patient care effectiveness. And we encourage healthcare providers to do so without the threat of them personally being attacked for acknowledging an error that they themselves made. In reality, these boards oftentimes come down very hard on my clients, despite the fact that my clients are the ones that alerted them to the error. So one thing for anybody getting into this practice area, in an overarching explanation, in the state of California, all of our licensing agencies are governed by the Department of Consumer Affairs. The Department of Consumer Affairs will farm out their authority and responsibility to individualize boards, departments, or agencies. Why? Because we want the board that deals with doctors to be comprised of doctors or those with medical knowledge. Same thing goes with Board of Accountancy. We want people with real world accountancy expertise to be on that board to bring that knowledge and skill set to the legal proceedings. So the Department of Consumer Affairs delegates their, their authority to the individual boards. The boards are then comprised um, typically, it's anywhere between seven and 13 uh, direct board of director panels. The directors for each one's composition varies, and I might actually be getting into that shortly, but more often than not, um, about a half to 65% are appointed by the governor, and then half or then the other portion are um, actually elected or run for uh, director appointments via um, different mechanisms. And it really depends on what board we're dealing with. But I always refer our new lawyers straight to the guidelines. Every single board is required to produce a set of disciplinary guidelines. Those guidelines in a perfect world you know, every case would be on a cookie cutter conveyor belt and all DUIs would have the same outcomes. All, you know, standard of care violations would have ostensibly identical outcomes. In reality, that's not fair and it does not serve the board's needs to protect the public. The board needs to fashion disciplinary action for each individual practitioner based on the facts um, of that particular case. And so uh, the disciplinary guidelines will not only tell you what the 
recommended level of discipline is for each and every violation. It also gives you ranges if whether it be a first offense or if it's somebody that has a prior history of discipline. So there are a big wealth of knowledge for anybody that's just getting into this practice area. Um, the type of actions, and this should actually, um, I understand why, why we worded it like this. So I, I, we're categorizing these type of actions, but these are also could be considered different phases of administrative litigation. So the very top one that we see here are citations. That refers to a civil citation. Civil citations in the state of California are non-disciplinary in nature. I say that again, they're non-disciplinary. What it is, is it's a fine that the agencies can send to a license holder saying, we're aware of an allegation. At this time, we're offering you to pay anywhere between $500 and $5,000 a civil citation with no admission of wrongdoing. So in essence, what I tell my clients is basically, if you get a civil citation in the mail, you can pay to make the case go away. And more often than not, that's what I recommend because it's in the client's best interest. Um, if you get a de minimis fine of, let's say, you know, 1500 bucks, even if the client did not do something that we believe is a standard of care violation, economically, it makes more sense for the clients to pay a thousand bucks and make the case go away before it ever incepts, as opposed to paying my firm several thousand dollars to defend a baseless action. However, various clients, their integrity means more to them. So they'll say, no, I'm not, I, even if there's no admission of wrongdoing, I'm not giving them one red cent because I didn't do anything wrong. But that's what a civil citation is. When you see BNP, that is in reference to the Business and Professions Code. Typically, under the Administrative Procedures Act, that group of statute incorporates the Code of Civil Procedure, the Business and Professions Code, and the Government Code. So I'm dealing, those are my, the main legal statutes that I deal with. The Business and Professions Code, um, the first you know, thousand statutes deal generically with um, all licensed professionals, but then the code itself actually gets into the regulation of each individual um, type of license holder. So, or will be predicated upon an agency. So the medical board has their entire section. The board of registered nursing has their own section of the business professions code. So goes it for all of the different agencies in the state of California. And I've got a little cheat sheet that I always use just to know where am I jumping into. If we're dealing with accountants, we're at 5,000 to 5,158. You know, if we're dealing with dentists, I'm in the 1900s. So um, B&P 820. 820 is a statute that requires the professional license holder to undergo a physical and or mental health examination. So oftentimes if a board gets a complaint about somebody and it has any allegations of, um, you know, mental health issues that would impair somebody's ability to work, the boards don't, they do not have to file a cease practice order. They don't have to require, um, a, a, a hearing, they can immediately send a BNP 820 order to the license holders requiring them to go see a doctor. Um, we do these quite often. There is a number of nuances. I don't think we have time to get um, in, in too great a detail regarding some of our defense tactics, but just to tilt my hand, one of the things that we've done because of my civil litigation um, background is we really started to incorporate more of a civil litigation defense medical examination um, style of interaction with the boards and the boards really don't like it because they're not used to having um, <laughs> they're not used to having to play by the rules they're used to making 
all of us license holders play by the rules, but then they're not they're not necessarily accustomed to an attorney um, exercising clients' due process rights and interests. And this might be a good portion for me to tell you all, it, under the Administrative Procedures Act, the code is written so that licensees do not have to hire a lawyer in order to defend themselves. Um, that gives us a lot of leeway because the code is is written for non-represented persons, meaning the, you know, the requirements of my clients in order to actually secure um, their due process hearings to defend themselves are very low. But the volume of work that an attorney can do disguise the limits. And so it's actually kind of a really fun practice area. And anybody that's interested, I encourage you to please contact me because there's not a lot of people that do professional um, license defense or administrative law. And, you know, we're a small group, but we're very close knit. So I'm going to keep on moving through these types of actions. PC 23, that refers to penal code. Penal code 23 is a statute that enables attorney generals or board staff councils, um, a majority of boards are represented by the California Attorney General's Office. So the Attorney General's Office actually has a licensing unit and they staff them with Deputy Attorney Generals um, designed solely to prosecute professional license cases. However, a few agencies actually still maintain their own internal staff lawyers. So to at the top of my head, the Department of Real Estate, they have their own set of lawyers where the medical board utilizes the attorney general's office. Long story less long, PC 23 authorizes a representative of the board to show up at a client's criminal action at the sentencing hearing and to make a sentencing recommendation. So what we've seen in the last five years are attorney generals on behalf of the boards showing up at criminal, during my client's criminal proceedings and making recommendations to the criminal court. Hey judge, you need to take this, you need to take this doctor's uh, dental license because of whatever. As you can imagine, it raises the ire of administrative lawyers because I get to go in and argue to the criminal court. Basically, if you take the recommended action, judge, why is there Administrative Procedures Act? Why do I even have a job? My clients are entitled to their due process protections and interests. They're entitled to a fair hearing. And we have an entire body of law that outlines what the procedures are. Why is the AG trying to pull a fast one and coming in here asking you to go above your authority and to detriment somebody's professional career. In reality, those requests can be appropriate in limited circumstances. So let's use the case of a, a pediatrician who is charged with uh, child abuse molestation allegations. In that event, you can understand why a criminal court doesn't want to allow a doctor to continue to treat kids if he's been abusing them. Um, so really the, the focus of the court's determination should be how related to the professional employment is the, are the criminal charges and to what extent is it necessary to protect the public from any potential uh, harm while balancing that against uh, professionals' vested interest in their career, occupation, livelihood. So PC 23s are when the attorney generals show up to the criminal case and they try to get the criminal judge to restrict a professional license um, in those proceedings. Now we're gonna move on to what we deal with more often. Statement of issues and accusations, these are ostensibly identical. The difference is if you are an applicant for professional licensure, then the burden of proof is upon the applicant to demonstrate that they are safe to practice in whatever clinical position or license they're seeking. Uh, 
And that burden of proof when it, upon the applicant is only a preponderance of the evidence. So more likely than not. Accusations are what, and so a statement of issues is what the agencies file when they deny an application. And so the burden is on the applicant to prove that they're gonna be safe. Accusations are what the agencies file when somebody already has a professional license and the state agencies are coming after the, the whole, the licensee. So accusations are akin to complaints in both the criminal realm and in traditional civil litigation. You file a complaint, the boards file accusations. Um, the service, there's different filing and service requirements. It's supposed to be via certified mail. They need to have a record that they actually serve somebody. You can't take a license away from someone if you can't prove that they were actually noticed. Uh, the intent to take their license and get, and that you were afforded, you know, an ability to, um, to fight it. All a client has to do to preserve their right to hearing is file a notice of defense. So a notice of defense is akin to an answer in both criminal and civil uh, litigation. Criminal, you understand what I mean? Criminal cases and traditional plaintiff versus defendant civil lawsuits. Notice of defense is akin to an answer. The boards provide a one, you know, one page form that the clients can file. Our law firm, again, using my civil litigation background, we draft what is much more, much more closely resembles a traditional answer. So we're asserting all of the affirmative defenses applicable on behalf of any client, preserving all of their rights. And, but again, the code is worded so that non-represented parties, so they give them these forms that they can file, but a, you know, a real litigator has tons of tools that we can utilize that our client, you know, non-lawyers don't even know about. So in terms of discovery, I often refer to my administrative litigation as basically diet litigation or litigation light. Um, it's not as onerous, it's not as cumbersome, and the state agencies are obligated to turn over their entire discovery if a respondent requests such. So the clients have to know to be able, they have to know to ask for it, but if they ask for it, the agency's obligated to turn over everything they have, just as I believe um, prosecutors are in criminal proceedings much akin, I think, to prosecutors in criminal proceedings. As you can imagine, oftentimes there's uh, exonerating evidence or exculpatory evidence that does not get produced to my office that we have to find. Um, and I think criminal defense attorneys deal with similar, um, similar issues. My obligations in terms of discovery, the code again is worded for non-represented litigants. So the code says, I am only required to produce, quote, that which I intend on introducing at hearing, end quote. As the lawyers in the group, I'm sure you can hear the holes in that language. You can drive a bus through. The way I interpret it is, if it's good for my clients, I intend on using it. And if it's not, I don't intend on using it and I sleep fine at night not turning over documentation that I'm not required to do. So again, similar, the prosecution does not turn over exc exculpatory evidence that they're required to do, but conversely, I'm not required to turn over uh, more damaging evidence. So it, it is novel and it's another little um, nuance that I really enjoy about our administrative practice. Um, Mitigation evidence. I put that as a separate category because a lot of the licensed defense lawyers I see are oftentimes focused on the underlying error or issue. Uh, I have found in my career one of the best avenues to get the most successful results for clients is not to 
I mean, we have to dispute the underlying issues. That's the main central focus of the case. But simultaneously, I just like to paint my pictures in the light most favorable for the court. Because if all they're looking at is an error, then the case is much more difficult for us to defend. Whereas I, if I demonstrate you got a 25 year career veteran, this is the first time any issue has ever arisen. It very quickly quells a judge's concerns regarding is this person going to be safe to practice or not. Um, so I put mitigation evidence up there because in throughout the course of discovery, I'm having our clients get as much favorable documentation as possible and we're hammering the boards with it to show they whether or not they made the underlying error that's alleged they're still a good person they deserve a second chance you know mea culpa the judge should grant them leniency and that's very directly related to settlements just like in traditional litigation and criminal proceedings you know 85 90 percent of all administrative cases should typically end in a settlement. Um, different agencies like the um, the Department of Social Services, when they're doing their child care licensing division, we call it the CCLD, that's for people that run daycares, um, either for children or for elderly. That agency is notorious. They take every single case to trial. They have no problem um, wasting judicial time and resources because in their estimation, from what their attorneys have told us, and the DSS also has their own staff lawyers. Their, their lawyers have told us, um, on my client, meaning the Department of Social Services, their responsibility is to protect the public. We don't know if this person's safe. When in doubt, give it to a judge. Then we've done everything that we needed to do and we can rely on that person's discretion. As you can imagine, it's very frustrating to me and my clients when there's a case that should obviously settle, but they're forcing us to go through a bench trial regardless. And then the last thing is the PHC MSCs. We do have pre-hearing conferences um, only in cases that are scheduled for four or more days of trial. Um, if it's not scheduled for more than... Uh, for four or more, then PHCs are not required and are typically not conducted. MSCs, Mandatory Settlement Conference. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> mandatory Settlement Conference are also required for hearings that are scheduled for four or more days. What my office has been, you know, very successful in using um, voluntary settlement conferences. So even for shorter trials that are only scheduled for one to three days, I often ask the attorney generals, um, what do they think? Would it be beneficial or not? And, you know, nine times out of 10, it absolutely is. And we go to voluntary settlement conferences and we enlist the help of the administrative law judges to try to help us get our cases settled. Um, the administrative law judges all come from the Office of Administrative Hearings. And whatever judge is assigned to your settlement conference will not be your trial judge. In San Diego, typically uh, the same judge, non-trial judge, will conduct both a PHC and, an, and the MSC. As you move farther north in California, from my experience, everything above LA, um, the actual trial judge, the trial judges conduct their own PHCs, and then they'll form a separate settlement conference judge. But the trial judges want to set the, you know, motions in limine, all of the trial briefing um, deadlines and requirements themselves. But not in San Diego. In San Diego, it's routine that um, a non non assigned non assigned to trial judge will conduct both of those hearings. So then the other kinds of actions that I deal with typically are petitions for reconsideration. I go to hearing, my client gets an adverse ruling. They only have two options. It's a petition for reconsideration and the, ne the next one, a writ of mandamus. It's a writ of administrative mandamus. Um, those are not mutually exclusive. So if we go to trial and we don't get the outcome that we wanted, my clients can do both, file a petition and file a writ. Petitions 
go directly to the agency that just issued the order. So in administrative cases, we go to trial. The judge will not issue um, an order that day. The administrative law judge has 30 days to issue a proposed decision and order. The thereafter, the agencies have a hundred plus days to take action on it. So oftentimes I go to trial and I don't get a final order for anywhere for three to four months after our hearing date. Um, once you get a final order, your client is entitled to file a petition for reconsideration directly with the agency if they don't like it. Concurrently, they have the option to file a writ of mandamus. Writs of mandamus have very high burdens of proof, and so they're more typically disfavored. But um, we're going to get into greater detail as time permits on all of these issues. And so in conclusion, the last kind of action I deal with is a petition for reinstatement. Um, somebody loses their license after a period of time, typically five years, they're allowed to come back into petition for reinstatement to get their license back. And so that's what um, we would do. Wow. So citations, as I previously discussed, it's a fine not to exceed 5000 um, for each violation uh, or it can contain an order of abatement. Citations are filed for these kind of violations, um, out of state discipline by regulatory board. That's typically very um, generous of the agencies. And in, I'm licensed in California and Nevada. So in Nevada, if I have a, a doctor who's licensed in both of my states and they get disciplined in California and they get a three year probation outcome, Typically, the Nevada Board of Medical Examiners says, okay, we're aware of the California action. We're going to give you a public reprimand, which is a low level of discipline, provided you successfully comply and complete California. So they don't add on additional discipline. California is the exact opposite. If I have a nurse disciplined in the state of Nevada, and I get her a public reprimand, and this has happened to me more times than I can count, oftentimes the California board wants to put that nurse on probation. And I have to argue to the attorney general, the board, and the judge, this person was disciplined for conduct that occurred in a different jurisdiction. That jurisdiction disciplined them. That jurisdiction determined that they're rehabilitated, and now they're you know, allowed to practice free and clear in the sister state where the misconduct occurred and the prior disciplinary action happened. California says, we don't care. We want to put them on a five-year probation ride because our only concern is the California public. And just because Nevada is more lenient than California, that doesn't satisfy our public protection. So it's actually pretty frustrating um, that California is such a punitive state and they, they are very um, severe when it comes to the level of discipline imposed on my clients compared to other jurisdictions. Um, here's some other kinds that you, if, if, like I said at the beginning of this, if you can get a civil citation, um, Typically, if you're, you can get your clients a civil citation, it, it will be in their best interest to accept it as opposed to fighting it. So under 820 and 821, this is somewhat interesting. The petition for the mental or physical health exam, like I said, the boards can require the licensee to take the exam. If the license doesn't go to the exam, that failure in and of itself constitute grounds. So if you call the board and you complain, I think my doctor um, is bipolar. Sometimes when I go in to see her, she's the nicest person in the world. Other times she just couldn't be ruder to me. The board would have legitimate grounds to investigate the mental health condition and possibly discipline the doctor based on that uh, medical issue. But just the failure for the doctor to have gone and completed the 820 evaluation in, in and of itself are grounds to discipline a license holder. 822 says 
if they're if the evaluator informs the agency that the licensee is impaired that's it they the agency can immediately issue a cease practice order they can suspend or they can revoke it in such a case if they do one of these automatic actions that expedites my ability to be in front of a judge so if they file the emergency actions like a, a restraining order it's akin to a restraining order i'm allowed within 30 days to be in front of a judge and get a final ruling does that suspension or revocation stand pending completion of a formal disciplinary action now when we're talking about the penal code section 23 this is when i was telling you that the attorney generals will show up to the uh, criminal cases this is it said it's filed by boards when a licensee is arrested and charged with a crime substantially related to their duties as a licensee i don't think that that's completely accurate it's supposed to be filed when they're arrested but it's typically not filed until a board is made aware of that and boards are made aware of license holders arrests via um a department of justice notification it's a san a subsequent arrest notification um but those sans are not they don't they don't come in all the time so what often happens to my clients is they'll be in the middle of a criminal case and then the attorney general gets started or for some people it's well after the criminal case has come and gone and only after there's a conviction of record does the board become aware of um, an arrest and subsequent conviction. A caveat to that for any practitioners in the audience is you need to check what board you're dealing with because a majority of boards in California have a 30 day mandatory self-report obligation post-conviction so a lot of times let's use duis my clients get a dui they fail to tell their licensing board that they were convicted now the board has two grounds to discipline them one well multiple actually multiple one ground is just the underlying use of alcohol in a dangerous manner two is the actual conviction of record that justifies disciplining the license holder but then you're going to add on three the failure to self-report which just makes the client look bad um and then you know it, it's just adding insult to injury and it makes your makes our jobs much more difficult in terms of protecting the client if they do fail to self-report so you definitely want to know what are the obligations with your particular whatever particular profession you're dealing with. Um, as this states out, so, I mean, the attorney generals file uh, PC 23 notice of appearance in the, it says superior court, but the criminal court, wherever it may be, it could be in federal or um, state, um, and serves both the prosecution and the defendants the boards are asking them typically to restrict professional activities of some sort more often than not they just say judge you should suspend their nursing license or medical license until the criminal case is resolved um and then you'll see if an order is granted because i do defend these quite often and sometimes the judges do list them and i'll give you an example um in the last dui case judge devaney who i did not think was going to grant the uh, attorney general's recommendation he did grant it in part which was he's not going to take this nurse's license and he's not going to say that she has to have practice supervisions but he it, he did require that she continue her um whatever you call the scram the alcohol monitoring bracelets because he thought this was a multiple dui offender if she continues to drink then she's a dangerous danger not just on the roads but in hospitals so he extended her um alcohol monitoring which i thought was fair based on that client's facts but again if if in that situation if an order is granted it's typically only in effect until the end of the criminal case um 
again, because the criminal judge doesn't have any jurisdiction, and that's the entire reason I'm teaching you guys about administrative litigation today, the, the, that's not the appropriate forum. At least that's my argument, and it's more often than not successful with the criminal um, court judges. And then here you go. This is, I was um, giving the example er earlier of um, a pedophile pediatrician, which would make sense. Here's a couple other, you know, if you get a nurse that's charged with elder abuse, um, say of her own mother, that, and, and she works in some kind of hospice or elderly patient population, that would be grounds where the judge would really need to the criminal court judge really needs to figure out, should I do anything to limit this nurse's ability to interact with other elders or not? Therapists who are charged with sexual misconduct um, with a, against the patient. And so, you know, not necessarily a situation which it's still a violation of standards if a therapist ever has sex with the patient within two years of treatment of the professional relationship, in a consensual fashion, but if this is, you know, sexual exploitation of some kind, then of course, we don't want to continue to allow that therapist to harm other patients during the pending criminal case. Um, and then you see pharmacy techs charged with possession of a controlled substance. Oftentimes I've seen judges want to have um, a workplace monitor for the pharmacy techs because if you have allegations of a pharmacy tech, who's stolen thousands of dollars of medications and he's selling them for tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars profit on the streets, you can see why a judge is not gonna allow that person to have access to additional narcotics during the criminal case. Um, statement of issues, you can read through this. I feel like we might be getting a little short on time, so I don't wanna belabor the points as I kind of talked about them during the first slide, but uh, statement of issues under these code provisions, the boards can deny an application. Um, more often than not, it's when somebody's convicted of a crime, even if it's been expunged. And that's one thing for any criminal defense practitioners in the audience. I want you guys to understand two things today. One, a conviction occurs the second your client pleads guilty or no contest. It is not the sentencing hearing. The conviction is the date the plea is entered under the government code. And so I oftentimes see criminal colleagues ill-advise our mutual clients and say, no, 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 you're not really convicted until you get sentenced. And I push sentencing out for 12 months. That is not the case under the Administrative Procedures Act. So be advised. Sentencing is the date somebody enters plea, not the date of sentencing. Um, in addition to that, expungements, deferred adjudications, and some of the novel um, settlement resolutions that often happen in the criminal world do not matter, or well, they matter, but they don't, they don't, they're not that helpful for administrative proceedings. So in particular, if somebody negotiates a plea where their client says they're guilty, but then they jump through hoops of fire for 12 months, and then the prosecutor subsequently withdraws the guilty plea, I'm sorry, yeah, the prosecutor allows the defendant to withdraw the guilty plea, and then the prosecutor dismisses the case, in the criminal world, it's like, nothing ever happened. That is the exact opposite. The second you said guilty in my world, that was the conviction. And the administrative courts don't care about the deferred adjudication. They don't care about any of that stuff. It's the second the word guilty or no contest falls out of your client's mouth, that's a conviction for my purposes. So um, I hope <laughs> everybody remembers that after, after today's lecture. Um, the common basis is dishonesty, fraud, and deceit. Um, or basically, if somebody does something that before they're licensed that would have caused them to have their license attacked or questioned if they were a professional license holder, then the boards have authority to deny them. Um, 
I'm going to skip over some of the statement of issues stuff. And again, I, we're going to share all of these slides after today. So um, I'm hoping that if anybody does have any questions or follow up, I know I'm going to run through a lot of the detail in terms of the statutes quickly. Please give me a call back. So these have to be notice pleadings under government code 11503. You see it has to be an ordinary, concise language. Um, it's not like civil litigation. So it's more about the notice to the license holder than compliance with technical rules. I've made various objections at trials before, and I've literally had judges allow attorney generals to hand write, delineate their act, their pleadings live at trial. And, and that's what, you know, that's what we get stuck with. Um, the accusation must recite the statutes and rules that the respondent is led to have violated uh, selfishly and lazily as a defense lawyer. I love the pleading requirement because it directs our attention straight to what are our clients alleged to have done wrong and that allows us to work the case backwards. Um, so if anybody is trying to get into this, it shouldn't be rocket science. Um, and as you see, an accusation can be amended to conform to the proof at any time before the hearing is submitted to include at hearing. So that's what I was just telling you about. Uh, these are very interesting and I think you guys wanna take a minute. I'll read them out loud since I can't hear or see any of our participants. But these are the big common grounds for somebody to be disciplined. And in this case, I guess we called our nursing client, um, client files. So number one, incompetence, negligence, substance abuse. Um, incompetence, often negligence is a catch-all. So the board's always alleged negligence. Then they can go gross negligence, which borderline incompetence. They're ostensibly identical. Substance abuse, we see a lot of, and it's unfortunate in this day and age, but people, you know, um, attempting to manage their own mental health and do so via narcotics or other, you know, ingesting other drugs. Um, charting errors is huge. And this is mainly for, you know, our healthcare folks, but the standards that the boards hold my licensees to, they themselves could never achieve. And literally the board thinks if you failed to chart one item, it is worthy of a three to five year probationary period. And, you know, my mom is uh, my law partner. She was a nurse for 13 years. She has explicitly argued multiple times. If you show me one nurse in this country who has not made a charting error, she deserves to be, you know, given a golden statue because every single person, it's it's consistent, but they they hold our clients to what I believe is an unachievable standard. Practicing without a license, um, this <laughs> you might think that it sounds like somebody's going around pretending to be a nurse, but what happens more often than not is the nurses don't don't renew or they fail to comply with their um, ongoing accreditation. So like basic um, life-saving, BLS certification or advanced cardiac life-saving, those kind of certifications fall out and then they become, then they're practicing outside of their scope. Um, conviction of a felony or any offense substantially related. Felonies are really bad. And if anybody doesn't know, a felony in my world, they treat it, it's much, much, much more egregious than a misdemeanor. Um, this says misdemeanor substantially related to the qualifications, functions, and duties of an RN. <laughs> what I found in practice is every single conviction, the fact that you are criminally convicted, the board's deemed to be substantially related. So if you get a criminal conviction, um, even like it, when it's for disturbing the peace, the cops will, I mean, the boards will look in the underlying arrest report and if there was alcohol or something involved, they still take action on it. Failure to report patient abuse to the appropriate agency, um, that happens quite often. Procuring a certificate by fraud, misrepresentation or mistake. More often than not, this is um, false applications for us. So somebody say has a DUI from 
different jurisdiction, they failed to disclose it on their um, initial RN application, they get their license, but they consider it a fraudulent application. Um, same goes with furnishing false info. Sometimes it's an unintentional oversight. Sometimes it's, you know, intentional omission because they don't want to disclose something and they don't think that they have to, but you, you have to disclose almost everything um, upon initial app licensure. Um, this is going to become, I think, much more uh, pressing after the Roe v. Wade recent overturn, involvement in the procurement or assisting in a criminal abortion. I'm very glad that, you know, our state is taking the steps designed to protect our uh, medical professionals, but this is uh, ripe for litigation. Um, violating or abetting violation of any section of the Nurse Practice Act, impersonating an applicant in an exam, um, or impersonating another licensed practitioner. I do not see these pop up that much. So um, I think my staff got these called from, uh, must have been a BRN report because I haven't seen those happen very much. Um, your answers must be filed within 15 days. I, I'm sure I'm running very short here. Let's see, is there any? We'll get to your question in a moment, Joni. Uh, government code 11506. Basically, you need to know my answer needs the akin to an answer, the notice of defense is only 15 days. You don't have 30 days to get it done. And oftentimes the clients don't even call you until a week or two after they receive the accusation. So it's a heightened time frame. Uh, discovery, as long as you request it, they need to give it to you within 30 days. They're supposed to produce everything. You, you the respondent is also supposed to produce everything that they have within 30 days of a request, but then we have the ability to continue to supplement as we approach a trial. And so that's what we do. We give them everything we've got up front and then we have the clients continue to gather the good mitigation evidence we talked about earlier. Um, discovery and administrative proceeding. I, I do have the option to file motions to compel. You can also move for protective orders. Um, so you notice I put on here, because this is a big difference uh, between the, the types of litigation. In my world, I don't get depositions. The only time I get a deposition is if the individual witness will not be available for trial. So you can only use it as a trial substitute. And as you can imagine, unless you get it on video, oftentimes they're not very effective. So they happen not very frequently. You do have the right to do it, but only if you can show that that person is going to be unable to appear at trial. And depositions, you know, they're, the best thing is for getting information from the other side. So unless I can prove that an adverse witness is not going to be available for trial, I don't get to depose them. That goes on to what I was just saying. Uh, we do have subpoena powers. <clears throat> my subpoena powers don't kick in until there's a formal disciplinary action imposed, which, you know, my client normally hire me, not normally, but they often hire us during the investigation. And I have to tell them we're in a, you know, a, a delicate spot because we have to proactively participate in the investigation, but we don't have any of the information or evidence against you. Um, and we're not entitled to it until formal de formal disciplinary action is initiated. Same goes with subpoenas. I don't have investigative subpoena powers. My subpoena powers only kick in once there's formal discipline. Um, and you can also file motions to quash and motions for protective order. I love administrative hearsay that I'll probably end on this one because um, in my world, I can get anything in front of the judge. Typically, I can get everything in front of the judge to be considered. Administrative hearsay does not get introduced into the record of evidence. But as most trial lawyers know, more often than not, we don't care if it goes in the record. You just want the judge to know it, to consider it when making their ruling. So we can get, um, you know, unverified written letters in, you name it. I can, if it supplements a witness's testimony and it's, you know, relevant, I can get anything in um, typically. And I think Lisa, it's this, should I try to 
pause it for now and we can just circulate the rest of these and I can answer some questions. Sure, I think uh, if you wanna go ahead and answer some questions and then if there's any time left, you might be able to go back. If you had anything else you wanted to cover, we do have a couple of questions. 